Thank you, Balaji, for that uh, really overly kind uh, introduction. I was thinking about this as I was returning from our annual Forbes internal sales meeting that we have in the beginning of January every year, and this one was in uh, Vieques Island, Puerto Rico, and, and so I was in Vieques yesterday, and, and our internal sales staff, we're, we're a much more global company than we were when I joined the company in 1992. When I joined the company in 92 and went to our sales meetings, all of our salespeople were basically middle-aged white men, and the amount of science and math that they had to do was, was uh, uh, really to do uh, uh, a couple things, maybe three things. They had to operate a fax machine, they had to add up a golf score, and they had to be able to tabulate a bar tab. <laughs> and, um, you know, today we're a much more diverse company and we're, we're probably, uh, our sales and marketing team is probably 70, 70 to 30 women. And to attend a conference like that, to have been transported from 1992 to 2014 and hear all the discussions about metrics and analytics and all of the things that are so vitally important to the media industry that nobody thought uh, would be necessary back in 1992, even though you could see the internet coming. Nobody knew really the full force of its impact, and you all know what's happened to our industry. And if we didn't have those kind of people, that kind of science, math, engineering type of person, even in the sales force, uh, we would be one of those media companies that uh, fell down and, and didn't get up, and there are a lot of them. Uh, we have a great panel. I'm going to quickly uh, introduce all of them, and then I'll I will start the discussion with, with Surya. Sitting next to me is Stephanie Cuskley, who is the CEO of NPower, uh, and uh, sort of a play on words. It, it's also about empowering uh, people in this area, and she's going to tell us what NPower is doing. Sherry Lassiter uh, comes out of a lot of the great work that MIT and uh, MIT Media Labs has done. We were talking about Nicholas Negroponte and so much of the great work there, and she's really at the forefront of of uh, digital production or 3D printing, give, people give it various names, and uh, what a great tool this is going to be, I think, to bring in, uh, bring in folks who have been left behind uh, that has been talked about all day. Yolanda Piazza is the Chief Administration Officer for, and glo of global, global Consumer Operations Technology for a small uh, financial institution called Citi. Uh, so she has a lot of responsibilities there, and, and city like Forbes, I mean, you know, uh, we're both in the information business, and therefore, if you're in the information business, you're on, uh, you know, you're, you're disruptable material if you don't get this stuff right, and so we're going to hear about uh, how they're thinking about that. And then uh, anchoring down the panel is Surya Kant, who's the president of North America, UK, and Europe of Tata Consultancy Services. Uh, which, by the way, you know, Talta is an over, in U.S. terms, it's an over $100 billion global multinational firm uh, in, in, in all kinds of different businesses. A lot of people don't know that TCS is, uh, is a $15 billion revenue company, probably the fastest growing part of Mighty Tata, and uh, Surya runs uh, uh, the biggest chunk of that. So I would like to start out with you, uh, Surya, and ask, um, you know, that. Uh, Tata Consultancy Services has led efforts around STEM 2.0. Uh, wh what, what's in it for you beyond good PR? <laughs> That's a very good question and that uh, gets asked uh, a lot of times. See, for us, uh, we see uh, wherever we are, uh, we work with corporations, we work with governments, we work with communities, finally. When we get business from the communities, and this comes from the Tata group uh, ethos, a corporation gets its business from the communities where it operates. So it is responsibility of that corporation or that enterprise to return that favor many times over. So we uh, are woven into the fabric of society where we operate. Uh, not many people know that for Tata group uh, uh, at, at the group level, 66% uh, of the group is owned by two philanthropic trusts. And Tata Group owns 75% uh, of TCS. So if you do the math, 50% uh, of the dividends that we declare, they go back to charities. So that uh, uh, 
attitude and that intent to really be uh, ingrained in the society, to be able to do something to always ensure that the society, uh, the, the communities are getting uh, positively impacted by our presence is very much our DNA. So when we started uh, our uh, North America Delivery Center in uh, Cincinnati in 2009, 2008-2009, we found that we could not hire as many uh, computer science people as we wanted to do. And then we, we looked at uh, the reasons, and one of the reasons we found was that there were not enough uh, kids uh, getting attracted uh, into computer science and IT-related courses from uh, high school and middle school. And then we started working with the uh, with, with, the, with the high school and that program now has expanded. That uh, program runs in 11 cities across North America. But the major reason for this is that if uh, a country has to prosper, it is very important that it has the necessary skills to be able to uh, raise its productivity to be able to address the issues, to be able to address uh, uh, the, the requirements for progress that are there for uh, the, the society. And around the world, uh, in the last 15 years, if you've seen, it is the digital skills that uh, are really required now to advance the, the industries, uh, the government. And more and more, our uh, banks, insurance companies, uh, airlines, uh, utilities, all of these are being powered by computers, being powered by IT and innovation and automation. And our workforce must be very much prepared, must be adequately prepared to take advantage of that. So that is the reason. And what, what um, you know, America has such great universities. And the secretary talked about best in the world, still the best in the world, but K through 12, particularly in the STEM areas, we, we continue to fall. Since you're not, you're not native to here, what, what, what the, what, what's your take on American K through 12? And give, a, give us your feeling, you know, as, as you're now so grounded in North America, what, you know, is the problem there or is the problem that there's a misalignment between uh, uh, what businesses want and what K through 12 is producing, or businesses just so wrapped up in their own challenges that they don't even know how to define it? I think there are uh, uh, mismatches on both sides. Uh, the businesses have to articulate better what they need. But at the same time, if you look at uh, our schools, in our schools, uh, only 70% of uh, the kids graduate out of high schools. And only 32% of those kids go to uh, colleges, right? If you look at the computer science part, only 17% of the kids really are, want to go into computer science. One of the things that we found as we work with the uh, kids uh, in the schools is that people, kids have this notion that uh, if I know how to use a uh, smartphone and if I know how to, uh, you know, play games, video games, I know all about IT and all about automation and Right. The other aspect on the, when, when the popular culture also uh, appears to have made it out, the people who are in computer science are geeky, nerdy, they don't really have social skills. So uh, they are outliers. So I think that aspect, one is the, the people uh, like us, uh, the businesses also have to articulate what sort of skills they need and what they require. And they have to actively work uh, along with the educators and the colleges to in fact uh, help them uh, bring out uh, such programs and, I, and, and uh, this STEM uh, innovation task force is, is, a, is a very good forum to really articulate that. But on the other side, as I said, the kids uh, in, in the schools as we go out, we also need to uh, educate them and talk to them as to what real life computing is and how uh, it would help them uh, you know, address the real world problems. Towards that, if I just take one more minute, it is also important to show to them that uh, working in IT is not just working in cubicles. It's not just uh, you know working uh, you know alone and 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 solving. It is working in teams, working in collaborations, working on real life problems. And uh, towards that, you know, we need to, in fact, create mentors within uh, from our industry. 
to work with uh, with kids in in high school middle school to to show to them you know uh, what it really means to uh, to look into uh, the information technology curriculum and how they can benefit from that well i want to come back to this all important point about collaboration and and its cousin diversity because i think we're we're trapped in the shallows there uh, for all kinds of reasons i want to see if we can, on the panel can maybe penetrate it a deeper level, but Yolanda, you've thought a lot about getting kids involved in an earlier level, and, and how do we overcome these, you know, cultural barriers that Suri talked about that it just doesn't seem to be cool, um, uh, particularly that, that it may, uh, people start peeling away in later grade school and early junior high because it's not cool, and girls start peeling away from it in particular. Why is that? And, and um, based on what you've learned, and how do we, how do we stem the, the loss and stem? <laughs> I think it's a great question and a great discussion. It's come up a couple of times throughout the day. We took a look at, as I was looking at our data across city for women in the uh, global technology organization, I looked and I said, we're pretty good. We're above industry average. We seem to be trending. It wasn't until I started looking at the pipeline of where our talent was gonna come from that I realized we had a huge gap and that just because we look great now, it's not sustainable. So we actually went back and reverse engineered the process. So we went all the way back and said, at what point do we need to start talking to girls in particular about technology and STEM degrees and how important it is and how do we do it? So we actually convened a panel of high school girls and we built a program and worked through what it was going to do to change and influence those girls. And the panel was phenomenal. I have to tell you, when we walked in, the first time said, this is what we're thinking about talking, we bombed. It was, they just looked at us and said, absolutely not. You're not coming to my school and talking about that. So we really worked with them to understand what we needed to do. And it really came down to a couple of things. We had to break down the stereotypical IT person. We had to make it truly relatable. We had to bring it back to social responsibility. And we had to prove and demonstrate how technology was going to be critical to any career they wanted to do. So we built a program. And in one week, we actually went out through a phenomenal group of volunteers. And we actually met, at, in one week, 3,500 uh, middle school and high school girls to change their perception of what it means to work in technology. And we very specifically stayed away from just coding. There's so much hype just around coding. We covered the gamut of what it means to work in a technology organization and actually built questionnaires where they could survey the types of roles. So we, we'd said, if you're really good at organizational skills and you like planning parties, you know, maybe the project management track is the right place for you. If you really like uncovering, you ask a lot of questions and dig into the root of something, maybe information security is something that you would like to consider. So we made everything relatable. In addition, we took our grad program, our technology grad program, pulled all the women out of that and had them go in and teach the program because they're relatable. People, all of a sudden, these girls could see themselves. They spoke the same language. You know, that they, they, they used a common body language. It, and it was so interesting to watch the girls react to this younger level set of um, kids coming back in that were really pretty cool. They weren't nerdy. So when we walked in the door and we did, did pre-surveys, how many of you are interested in a career in technology? It was 30%, and I think some were being kind. When we walked out, we surveyed again, it was 69%. So we said, okay, we did pretty well. What, what, beyond the improvement, the more than doubling of that number, what, what surprised you most? What surprised me was a couple of things is they all latched on to, you know, we, we walked them through real people in technology, a day in the life. And one of the girls, we actually had a video for them, and one of the girls had a shoe closet with 400 pairs of shoes. That to them resonated with them. All of a sudden, they could tie this career to a future that they saw themselves participating in. So being able to take it all the way through, they're like, I want to travel. You know, so we had uh, people talking about the travel that they did. I want to travel. I want to own 400 pairs of shoes. And then we talked about each of the jobs 
and the average salary. So we took you know, statistical data and said, this is what you could be earning. And let me tell you what that means to you. So your first job, this is the type of lifestyle you could be leading if you think about this as a career. Today, we got the results back from, we went back in and surveyed them a year later. And 70% of them are still highly interested in a career in IT. You so know, the sustainability it, was huge. Yeah, it's a challenge, right? Uh, you know, 18-year-old son is a huge fan of um, the movie series Iron Man with Robert Downey Jr. And I try to point out, and I'm just not successful, I said, you know, there's a real life Iron Man a few miles away. His name is Elon Musk. <laughs> you know, he's got this cool car company. He's, he's into yeah. space stuff. Right. You know, he, he's got more money than, you know, and, uh, he, my son still prefers to watch Robert Downey Jr. Cher, you've, you've, I think you've, you're on to something um, real cool. Uh, tell us about the, the Fab Foundation as a way to get in um, people, expose them to uh, uh, the digital world, the technological in the world outside of the, the normal algorithmic way, which is th this crushingly tiny filter. Right. Well, maybe, maybe one way to, uh, to kind of get into this is to talk about um, uh, the idea of uh, digital fluency. So um, if you think about all the new world wealth in the world or much of the new wealth in the world is being created through uh, sort of um, online application services, products, uh, and we define digital literacy through that, uh, through that, 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 um, fo that prism. And, um, uh, but what we do at MIT, I'm, I'm at MIT and with the Fab Foundation, so we spun off um, uh, Fab Labs uh, from MIT, from this class called How to Make Almost Anything at the Center for Bits and Atoms. And really what it's about is uh, taking the bits of the world and making its, or taking the its of the world and making them bits. So we, we really have to make things. We have to measure and modify and make things in the world. And then we also have to take information in the world and bring that into the way we design the future, design our future technologies and products. So um, that's really what Fab Labs are about. Um, it's about, these are rapid pro prototyping platforms or prototyping platforms, digital fabrication. So digital design tools and digital uh, uh, fabrication tools things like laser cutters and wood routers and 3D printers and all those sorts of things. And what they do is they provide a beautiful environments for um, innovation and education, technical education, uh, engaging environments, hands-on environments, environments in which the student or the user pulls for knowledge when they need it, and then they apply it right away. And that turns out to be very empowering and a very powerful learning experience. So well, yeah, I think this is doing. so wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't know that most of you know, but I live, I've live in Silicon Valley, not New York. I've lived in Silicon Valley my whole adult life. And I was born and raised in North Dakota, but I moved to the Valley in the 70s when it was just becoming known as Silicon Valley. And it's known that because of the semiconductor industry. And when you look at the history of the Valley, you know, Bill Hewlett and David Packard started the first company. And they were, by their nature, tinkerers. Um, uh, uh, the great Tom Wolfe, the writer, wrote a piece on Bob Noyce, the co-founder of Intel for Esquire magazine called The Tinkerings of Rob, uh, Robert Noyce. Steve Jobs and his uh, uh, father adopted him were tinkerers. You know, they would uh, rescue furniture from the junkyard and, and remake it into something good. And his father taught him how to look for good, you know, thrown away furniture. And if you went to Silicon Valley today, if you were a stranger, you'd look at all the companies like Google and Facebook and Twitter, and you, you would call them algorithmic valley. And I think this is actually a shame because it's so narrowly defined what digital fluency is around this concept that if you aren't an abstract thinker, uh, if you aren't, uh, didn't have an 800 in your math SAT test, you don't belong here. And, um, but, but, but the capital markets keep reinforcing that you need that kind of expertise. So mm -hmm, I just, mm -hmm, I offer mm -hmm. that, that I think that what you're doing is so wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, this is very important, I think. Um, the Obama administration and other nations have become very interested in the maker movement in general because it stimulates creativity and innovation and sort of all the things that we've listed today as being skill sets that we, that we want our workforce to have in the future around STEM. Um, and not, you know, and just in general. Um, 
but you, to scale something like this, it doesn't work to take a, a top-down approach. So for instance, USAID and World Bank have been interested in this, in taking kind of a top-down approach, and it doesn't work. What does work is, and I'm going to call out here Chevron Corporation, what they've decided to do is invest in STEM, in all of the communities in which they operate. And what they've done is they've invested in STEM centers, they've invested in Project Lead the Way, they're now building fab labs in those communities. And it's a win-win situation for, for both. And it's kind of similar to what you're talking about. It's sort of paying it forward, um, like City is doing. Um, because they, you develop your own, um, you, de you, you seed your own workforce in the future, but you also help that community find better economic opportunity. And I think that's a really important thing to remember as we think about trying to scale all of the really interesting um, things that we've heard about today. Mm -hmm. well, before we go to Q&A, uh, we want to hear from Stephanie Cuskley, who is the CEO of NPower, and, and just as you're doing with the Fab Foundation, you're doing some original thinking on this whole topic of getting more people, uh, expanding the, the number of people who feel like they belong in the STEM movement. And tell us about uh, NPower and, and how you go about doing that. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Um, NPower is very focused. Interestingly enough, we're, we're focused on inspiring people to pursue tech as a career. We do that through uh, getting the tech community engaged in, in getting in the classroom. Um, but interestingly, we, we also we realize that not all people know what they want to do in life when they graduate out of high school. Not all people come from backgrounds that enable them to go on in life to college or community college, uh, whether it be because of income, because of situation. Um, and so what we do, we've started training programs for the underserved, uh, at-risk youth between the ages of 18 and 25, and also veterans who are returning and who don't know what to do or how to do it. Um, we have basically a six-month training program that incorporates a lot of what was talked about today. It incorporates an internship. It incorporates heavy engagement of the corporate technology community in being uh, role models in the classroom, in being mentors, in creating the curriculum that they want to hire from. And we have a phenomenal track record. Uh, we 80% of those young people and vets who go into the program, 80 to 90% graduate. These are young people who have a high school degree, barely got through high school or GED, barely got through, um, you know, have huge challenges. 80% uh, graduate and 80% have a job with an average salary in the 30,000 uh, plus range within six to nine months. Um, that's a group of people who, but for a program like this, would be unemployed or $9 an hour at McDonald's. There's no question. And what it proves to us time and again is that this technology, STEM, is not exclusive to college level people. It is a skill that can be taught in a very quick amount of time and it gives them digital fluency to enter the tech workforce or alternatively any other job that requires these skills. Uh, needless to say, it's not just tech, it's also professional skills, because as we also heard today, it, it, you got to have both. Well, it's, it, it's interesting, you know, given the timing of um, uh, President Obama's uh, initiative, which I guess he's going to talk about more in the State of the Union, of uh, having uh, more money going into community colleges. And I don't know if any of you read the New York Times op-ed page today, but Tom Hanks um, wrote a piece on, you know, how junior college uh, Chabot College in Hayward, California, changed everything for him because he wasn't ready for a four-year college. Now, we're, now we're, we're not talking about STEM, but you're talking about kind of the same thing here. Totally. And, uh, and, and in fact, you're doing some really innovative work with, with junior colleges. We are actually, the programs we run are all within community colleges because what we, what we have done that I think the community colleges need to do at scale is we've integrated the corporations. Rob talked about it earlier. We need to integrate the corporate skill, the corporations into the teaching and into the curriculum. And we've done that. We've really perfected how to do that. And so we're rolling out our program into community colleges across the country. Um, so we hopefully can do in the tens of thousands uh, within the near term. So, but it's that that you need to do. Well, you should hook up with the Aspen Institute here also in town because they've got a whole community college curriculum that's quite, quite great. Um, we'll open it up for audience Q&A and I, and I do want to sneak in one question about, uh, or at least a comment on I think how we're misdefining 
diversity and leaving a lot of opportunity on the table. But questions? Hi, I'm, I'm Marie Schwartz, the CEO of TeenLife.com, which is a search engine for opportunities for teens. And we specialize in all kinds of things teens can do, especially when they're not in school. So summer programs looms large, but surprisingly, out of the 13,000 listings that we have, the thing that draws the most traffic to our site is community service. Now, I'm going to say that because it's required by many schools. And I think the secret to some of the girls you dealt with is that it, um, other types of digital literacy are not required. I remember when I was in school, I had to take a key, uh, keyboarding class. You know, I learned, had to learn how to type. It was a required course in my school. And I think to the degree that we can get schools to require, you know, design a website about yourself or you know, build that into the curriculum, do you think that that's feasible? Do you think schools can mandate uh, some digital fluency? Because if that were the case, then we would get tons of kids coming to our site looking for digital fluency uh, opportunities, or, or mandate internships when you're a senior. Um, my kids went to a school that required an internship. It was the best thing they ever did. And I, I, you know, they were fortunate, and I just wish what, do you guys have any comments on how we can get Yolanda, the why don't school you system? You, you look like you're eager to. So, so mm -hmm. um, absolutely. So um, in Florida, we will, we've been working actively with the schools. One of the things that they had identified was there was an optional class around technology, introduction to technology. We've asked to, if they can move that all the way back to the middle school, it's a high school class, move it back to the middle schools and make it mandatory because we can then partner with that for an ongoing effort to really make sure that we lock in and capitalize. And then it's not just a girls program either. So they have started that. They have mandated it this year that it has to be now done at seventh grade, which gives them then the option going into eighth grade. They've been through that. They've been through our program to then pick a technology-based academy. So that's exactly what they've done is really pushed it down. What we're doing to partner is then we're taking a group of those girls. Once they get into high school, we actually bring them in and do an internship. We're tying into that social responsibility because a lot of them do want to find ways to give back. We are having them come in and teach the next class that comes in the next year. So I don't have to put this demand. This class, we bring them in for a week and they, um, it cost $7,000. I mean, it was nothing to put together a one-week internship for 20 girls to come in and build a SheBot using a Raspberry Pi, go through all levels of uh, technology, and then present that back to some very senior people, parents, um, faculty, peers, and uh, technologists. So, and then from there, they're actually going to come back in and do an eight-week for all of those that, that loved it, are now going to come back and do this eight-week internships. So what we're trying to do is move that way back into the middle school, prove that they are truly capable of taking that class. They're actually seeing much higher results because the kids were bored with the class in our high school. It was too easy. They, they knew it, so they didn't pay attention to it. Um, so moving it back in, it's really changing the kids now that want to sign up for a tech academy and then we're going to be there to actually help influence the curriculum of the Technology Academy, knowing what we want, coming back to can you employ them coming out of high school versus waiting for a four-year degree. Cheryl de Cruz Young from Diversified Search really applaud the, the specific example in regards to City. And I think as we, our, our commitment at Diversified Search is executive talent, but we search very broadly and ensure we have diversity. And what I've seen in the um, a common theme that I've come across with executives who are gender or ethnic diverse is this, I look back and they tell me about their story. Early on, and it's normally middle school, if we're looking, because I, I lead our industrial practice, so if we're looking at STEM background, it's often from an early um, encounter where they went to a university and they spent a week in a university and they were exposed to these particular areas or exactly what you were sharing in terms of city. You know, just exposing, because people, kids don't know. And it is, it's the, it's the video games and it's the, the smartphones. And I wonder, you know, back to your point before, how can we actually, in a very simple way, in a, higher, in a K through 12, 
make that as part of the program, that type of, whether it's going to a local community college or the, the colleges in the area, but giving exposure, especially, I think, we talked about um, the, one of the, the, the skills gap, but the, the economic gap. So I'm, I'm all for the women, million women mentors, especially, but this is critical, and it's actually fundamentally quite easy to do, I think. So I think it's both curriculum and exposure to, as you said, the curriculum in the, in the actual classroom and exposure to real world technology professionals, which is the, I want the 400 pairs of shoes, I want the this. So we've actually created a platform that the New York City Department of Ed is using in their career in tech ed high schools, where they can actually just put a little note in and say, I need a career speaker on security for such and such a time. And we actually go out into the city banks and the Tatas of the world and actually just find someone to speak on that topic on that time at that location. So I think we can actually, I'm very positive about change. I really believe we can do this. It's going to take longer than we all want, but we can do it and we will do it. Um, and, and, you know, Yesterday, the National Research Council, the Board on Science Education, actually released the first guidelines to implementation of the next generation science standards. Now, as all of you, or most of you know probably, the next generation science standards is the first rule book that actually combines science and engineering as, if you wish, the standard set for K-12 in the US, uh, focusing on, on cross-cutting issues, which is very much what we're talking about in STEM. I'm raising this point only because I think it's an opportunity for us to read from the same sheet, from the same page for the first time. Uh, business and industry uh, very much would, under, uh, would write under and, and approve those not, uh, NGSS, National uh, Next Generation Science Standards. And for those of you, us, and all the others who have not yet begun to form public partnerships, uh, private public partnerships. I think knowing now that this document will be in the hands of administrators and teachers in the next couple of years, by making ourselves familiar with that, we have an opportunity to actually speak the same language. Can I um, just sort of build on that? I think um, one of the one of the big concerns right now is uh, that not all the states want to adopt NGSS, and I think teachers are rather intimidated. And so uh, part of the public-private partnership that you're talking about should really be aimed at um, helping teachers strategize and figure out how to integrate this into their curriculum. I mean, that's what the, the guide is for, but you, you, we need to do it in a more hands-on way. If the goal, the holy grail of this is innovation and young innovators, we might even be able to achieve greater yields in uh, outside of the classroom. So uh, the 3D and the whole tinkering thing is something that we see uh, students who have failed in the current education system gravitate towards. Our number one site visit is the 3D printer up in Harlem, who takes in students, takes them in for the day, shows them how it works. Oh my God, we get more kids deciding to follow technology as a career because of that. It's like giving a guitar to young Elvis. Yes, yeah. no, it's amazing. So, no, I'll, I'll just say, you know, uh, for example, in one of the things that we found, uh, uh, how do you really get kids interested into, um, into IT is uh, to make things fun. So we got uh, robots and we uh, taught kids to program those robots and then when uh, they see uh, the, the, that uh, they can move the hands of the robot or the eyes of the robots can be moved or, you know, some expression, and then we, you know, you could see that uh, these kids were, uh, you know, full of joy. And, and many of these kids, when we, when we got uh, feedback from the schools, these f kids were uh, people who were not really interested in classes or they were skipping the classes. And uh, so the point that you made uh, is, is that you have to make things fun. You have to make things uh, a little non-formal, uh, not something which is, uh, which is too... Uh, algorithmic or uh, you know uh, uh, too uh, th theoretical, and and we were able to uh, you know get kids to then uh, form teams and and take that robot through a maze, and then uh, you know that would be uh, a competition amongst the teams, and then we brought their parents to watch that because we believe also that the, uh, as as parents uh, we must be telling other parents that how important. Uh, is this activity and what it would lead to if they were to follow this career, then the whole uh, economic, uh, uh, you know, upliftment and, uh, you know, salaries and those things, then those things come in. So this is 
I, I agree with you that if you make things uh, a little non-formal and make uh, uh, things a little bit uh, fun, then you know, that's another way of uh, taking this forward. What I'm seeing in the Valley, and this is the point I was going to make about diversity, is some of the most innovative companies are mashing up um, non-STEM people with STEM people. They're, putting, they're seeing the value. Tony Fidel, uh, who founded Nest Labs, Google bought it for three billion and change about a year ago, mashes up left brain thinkers, right brain thinkers, old people, young people. He still gets the kind of uh, uh, race and ethnic, uh, ethnic and gender diversity that he wants, but he gets it in a much more valuable, powerful way. It isn't just ticking off boxes. It's doing it you know, to really expose. And what he finds that, that is the result of that is he's raising the STEM IQ of the non-STEM people significantly throughout the organization. So that's sort of another informal uh, way uh, that it's getting done and, and uh, w with people who are doing it uh, for, f uh, you know, because it's the profitable way of doing business. I also see that there's, um, there are pioneers out there that are trying to flip the bit on, on how you educate. So instead of you know, sitting in class and getting lectures and, and then going home and doing your homework, they're trying to make it the other way around, such that you go home and you watch your lectures and video and you read your books and then you come in and you do the hands-on or whatever it is. And that seems to be also a very powerful approach that does cross the uh, formal informal um, boundary. Shows promise. Well, thank you, panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.